back screen introductory screen isn't it exactly yeah thank you okay good good morning everyone thank you for all the exam going trainees joined us in the youtube episode on exam preparations today we are doing the second episode on euro technology in the first episode we discussed the basic purp set optical erythrotome etc in the end of this video you will be having a link to that first episode of euro technology on your left hand side we have a trainee who has kindly volunteered to discuss this second episode euro technology on the stone procedures welcome good morning mr d and thanks for this opportunity i'm also ha happy to share this video in the social media for the future reference for the trainees and for the uh, persons who are preparing for the frc euro thank you so much good thank you very much you have a patient with 11 mm stone in left side upper ureter is quite fit otherwise 40 year old no previous stone episodes presented with acute urinary colic treated conservatively now he is listed electively for ureteroscopy of upper ureteric stone at the level of l3 slash l4 vertebrae how are you going to start the day um on on the day of surgery i will uh, meet and greet him in the pre operative ward i'll make sure that he has uh, read the bowel information leaflet on the procedure i'll address any concerns uh, for him regarding the procedure i'll briefly tell him the uh, risks involved the benefits and any alternatives which have already been discussed um i'll talk to him regarding the intraoperative procedures in briefly in layman terms and also what what could be the post operative recovery and i'll specifically mention about the stent and stent symptoms if it is needed and the uh, the further post operative follow up uh, i'll confirm his consent i'll mark uh, the left side on his body and during the uh, team huddle uh, if there are any concerns i'll inform the team regarding this and in uh, once he is in the, in the theater in a, uh, he, once i make sure that he is properly consented anesthetized and in the lloyd davis position who check list done uh, antibiotics given um, i'll uh, start with uh, prep and drape uh, st start with a cystoscope first uh, we'll inspect the urethra uh, inside the bladder make sure that there is nothing abnormal and then um start with a uh, sorry in between i had to mention that i'll uh, make sure that the fluoroscopy is available in the theater and also i will go through the uh, uh, instrument set and make sure that all the instrument set is available uh, like the cystoscope sheet guide wires contrast ureter catheter semi semi rigid ureteroscope and flexible ureteroscope as uh, standby um and then i'll inform the team that i will take at least 1 to 1 and a half hours for the procedure so coming back after after the cystoscope done i'll um, insert a gu guide wire in, into the left ear record case and confirm the position with the fluoroscopy um this will be uh, followed by the insertion of the uh, semi rigid ureteroscope and at the uh, ureteric orifice if it is if there is any difficulty i'll always you say second guide wire to go into the ureter with the semi rigid scope once i reach the level of the stone um, uh, i'll try to make sure because this this is in the upper ureter my main aim is to avoid the retropulsion of the stones so i will remove the guide uh, guide, guide wire i'll make sure that the irrigation is sufficiently enough for the vision uh, then insert the uh, laser uh, and in the ureter i use the 200 micron and always start with the 0.5 uh, i mean the 5 5 hertz uh, 0.5 milli uh, 0.5 joule settings and then start uh, laser lithotripsy uh, if it is progressing well i'll keep on uh, i i'll make sure that i am not touching the ureteric wall and always try to uh, give the laser on the center of the stone Uh, if needed i'll increase the frequency uh, i'll try to keep the uh, power like that only in the ureter but if it's a very hard stone then i have to increase the power slightly 
after the procedure, I'll make sure that all the stone fragments are, uh, re, uh, I mean, powdered. And if if the uh, ureter is not, uh, if the ureter is friendly, if it is not too tight at the ureteric orifice, then I can use a uh, basket to get a stone fragment for analysis. But if there is any concern of ureteric injury or prolonged procedure, I try not to do the basketing. Um, this will be followed, so all the time, the safety guide wire will be in place. And this will, this will be followed by a, a retrograde study and insertion of a, um, a ureteric stent um, uh, and the position confirmed with the fluoroscopy. And I will, uh, during all this procedure, I'll save all the relevant images uh, in the PAC system. Um, this, this, is, this is followed by emptying of the bladder and I'll tend not to leave a catheter. Um, we'll make, make sure that the patient is safely transferred to the post-operative ward. Uh, we'll rec uh, document all the uh, findings and the procedures if any uh, inadvertent things happen during the procedures in the uh, operation notes. We'll give a clear instruction uh, of the post-operative plan. After that, I'll review the patient in the post-operative ward. Uh, we'll, uh, if the patient has recovered by that time, I'll inform him how the procedure went, whether it went as planned or whether there was any surprises. Uh, I'll also hand over to, to the post-operative uh, team uh, about the plans. Usually this is done as a day case procedure. I'll make sure that his discharge contains um, clear instructions of taking lots of water, uh, informing about the stent symptoms and analgesics, and we'll make arrangements to see him uh, back in the, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the theater for the removal of the stent. Usually in, uh, it's a straightforward procedure, one week time, but if there are any concerns, they'll keep it for two weeks. Uh, sometimes if it is like a ureteric injury during the procedure, uh, then we'll keep it a little bit longer, like three weeks. Uh, this will be followed up by, and also the patient will be followed up later in uh, three months time for the regular phone follow-up, uh, sorry, stone follow-up. Okay, good. That's a nice comprehensive overview of um, upper ureteric stone approach. Now, since it's a technology table, let's dive into the details of the technology items you have used in this due course. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the guide wire. So when you place a cystoscope and pass a guide wire into the left electric orifice, what is your choice of guide wires? So uh, I use the uh, sensor guide wire, which is a hybrid guide wire, which has got a hydrophilic tip and a PTFE coated uh, 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 body. So uh, it, it has got two, uh, two the advantage of the hydrophilic guide wire and as, uh, as well as the advantage of a standard guide wire in the sense that it can easily go through the ureter without damaging the ureter. It can bypass the stone even if it is slightly impacted uh, and uh, it will not slip off easily like a hydrophilic guide wire or a glide wire. So sensor, I'll always try to use the sensor guide wire, but if it is really difficult to bypass a stone, I'll change into a hydrophilic guide wire. But once it, once I made, uh, get, get the access, I'll always try to change it to uh, the sensor guide wire back uh, because uh, it, it, it will remain in position during the whole procedure. Okay, the sensor guide wire is also hydrophilic, but the degree of the uh, philic, the lightness to water will differ. And yeah. um, because it is not as hydrophilic as a glide wire, it will relatively stay in place. And also the main thing is it is atraumatic because of the flexible tip and it can negotiate an obstructing stone. And it's a good one to do it as a primary guide wire to start with. When you have difficulty in entering with your erythroscope, you said you will use a second guide wire. What is your choice for the second guide wire? Uh, for the second guide wire, um, uh, hy hy hydrophilic guide wire is the, one, of, one of the best option um, uh, because uh, uh, for uh, the main use of second guide wire is to go through the ure collapsed ureter to make a space and also to uh, do the technique of railroading that is inserting the uh, ureteroscope in between the guide wires. So in our, sorry, uh, uh, in my practice, I'll use a second uh, sensor guide wire as a second guide wire as well. Okay, nothing wrong in using second sensor guide wire. We need to keep in, uh, keep in mind the cost involved. 
the sensor guide wires are costly compared to the normal PTFE guide wires. So okay. since you have a guide wire in place, nothing wrong in using the normal PTFE guide wire as a second guide wire because okay. that will help you to negotiate the orifice. And once you negotiate the orifice, you may not need a second guide wire for the rest of the mid ureter and upper ureter. And the second reason is if you have a different colored wire, sometimes it will also help you to differentiate which one you kept first for a safety guide wire, which one you are using second as a working guide wire. Right. For this patient who never had ureteroscopy prior, mm -hmm. what type of ureteroscope you're going to choose? Uh, so in our practice, uh, I use the, uh, uh, I'm sorry to bring the uh, trade names, but still I use the stores one with a six French tip and seven French body. Uh, so uh, for a primary ureteroscopy, I'll use this uh, 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 semi-rigid scope, which is the smallest one. I mean, uh, smallest, uh, small tip size available. Six French at the tip and uh, increasing to seven French at the body. Okay. Leaving the trade names, is there any other ureteroscope available smaller than six French in the tip? Yeah, I'm aware that there is a, a, a ureteroscope available with a four French, 4.5 French at the tip. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So if it is available, a 4.5 French in the tip and the base could be like six or seven French is a quite ideal one to start with for primary ureteroscope. Mm -hmm. We try to use only one ureteroscope. We try to avoid opening a couple of ureteroscopes for a patient. But for primary ureteroscope, by having the choice of 4.5 French, you are increasing the chance of completion, reaching the stone, and uh, dusting the stone or fragmenting the stone, which we'll come to later. And 4.5 French also is quite ideal to navigate uh, VUJ, which was not traveled in the past. Mm -hmm. The patient had previous ureteroscopy or presence of a stent, then you can directly go to a six French. Of course, this depends upon the availability. So mm -hmm. if available, a 4.5 French is quite ideal. What is the disadvantage of using 4.5 French ureteroscope compared to the six French ureteroscope you mentioned? Um, it is regarding the uh, channel. So the six French uh, has got a, a four French channel. So we can uh, put the standard uh, uh, baskets and also the irrigation is much better with that channel. But with a 4.5 four, four, 4. French, the irrigation channel will be a smaller one. Um, so uh, I think the vision will not that will not be, the, I mean, the irrigation fluid and vision will not that be good like in a small, small one. Yeah, obviously the working channel will be bigger and so you will get a better irrigation and also you can pass the better equipments and uh, the flow will be good, the vision will be good. And um, it all depends upon the working channel size and whether we are using any accessories through the working channel. Mm -hmm. Now, take me through this picture. What are you saying? So uh, I'm seeing a, a semi-rigid ureteroscope. Um, it is, uh, I can see numbers marked. One is the shaft of the ureteroscope. Two is the light pillar. Three, uh, it is a offset um, uh, telescope. Uh, and there is one and two. Uh, so uh, that is the valve that prevents the backflow. So it, uh, it allows the passage of instruments, but it also uh, allows uh, I mean, the water not to come out when there is no instrument in the semi-rigid ureteroscope. And four, five and six are bridges. So I think this is a, a dual bridge. So uh, there is two channels for that. And the, uh, one is for the irrigation, one is for the outlet. And the third one is used for the passing the instruments. Okay. The third one, the number three is the offset eyepiece. Okay. That's IPs, the correct yeah. terminology. Yeah. Light port, you said correctly. The one and two Roman letter marked or the one where you can just use it if you are not using any accessories. This is uh, just to close and open it. But when we use the bridge, we have the facility to use the taps. The four is the left and right tap, which are presented right angle to the shaft. 
since it is right angle, the irrigation will be slightly away, not making the entry towards us, which will make the working side more less cumbersome and less clustering. And uh, these taps can be interchangeable. You can use the irrigation on the left side or right side based upon your right or left handed or maybe side of the stone, whatever your personal wish also. The port six is very good for introducing the laser wire because it's nice to use the laser wire without any angling so that the laser cable won't break up. So port six is specifically for laser wire. That's why offset IPs will be very handy whenever you are using this um, laser for lithotripsy. You said you want to use 200 micron fiber. What are all the other fibers useful, available? Uh, uh, so there is this um, uh, 300 size available uh, and also 600 size available. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I said 200. Um, I, I, I would like to change that. In the ureter, we can use the 300. 200 is mostly used for the upper tract and especially in the lower pole. Uh, so we can use 300 in the uh, ureter. Sorry for that. Okay. The size depends upon, the, again, the manufacturers. Sometimes you have size like 200, 350, 550. Sometimes you have size like 200, 300, 500, depends upon the, the product catalog. Mm -hmm. Now, there is nothing wrong in using 200. By using a 200 micron fiber, you may have more space up for the irrigation to flow. And um, in the rare case, when the stone migrates to the kidney, if you have to open a flexible erythroscope, the same 200 micron you can use for the flexible erythroscope also. Wow. By committing to 300 or 350 micron, again, it's not a bad choice. You can confidently use it, especially if the stone is in the VUJ or lower ureter. But when the stone is in the upper ureter, by chance, if the stone is very mobile and if there is a good hydronephrosis, you will struggle using 350 microns when we have to convert to a flexible ultroscope. Still it's possible, but not very useful because the whole fiber will occupy the working channel. Some flexible ultroscopes may not even accept 300 microns because of the smaller working channel. Okay, then you, said to me about the laser as a source for breaking the stone. What mm -hmm. other methods by which we can break the stone using ureteroscope? Um, I can use the, uh, uh, um, the, the one with the jackhammer effect. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, the electrohydraulic uh, lithotrite, and also mm -hmm. the there is also ultrasonic powered uh, 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 lithoclast, sorry, lithoclast available. And uh, yeah, these are the two things I know, the electrohydraulic yeah. and the ultrasonic power. Ultrasonic is not much used nowadays for ureter because there is a high chance for ureteric uh, mucosal injury whenever the ultrasonic probe is in contact with the wall. And electrohydraulic lithoclast also is now less used because of the availability of better laser fibers. Laser is uh, such a good energy source, it can break any stones of any Hounsville unit while lithoclast will struggle whenever the Hounsville unit is rising above 1200 or 1500. You said about the settings, why the settings are important, what are all the variables which you can play with? So and the variables are, um, uh, I can uh, adjust the power as well as the frequency. Depending on the power and frequency adjustments, I can either dust the stone or fragment the stone. So if I want to dust the stone, I'll use uh, low power, high frequency. But if I want to fragment the stone, uh, it is the other way. So uh, high power and low frequency. Uh, so. In which situation you will prefer dusting? Which situation you will prefer fragmenting? Uh, in the stones, in the... Uh, Kidney, kidneys in the pelvic ulcer system, I prefer dusting. And also uh, for, for stones in the ureter, we can go for fragmentation. You can do dusting even in the ureter, nothing wrong in it. The only thing is the dusting will take some time. It produces uh, multiple small fragments. You don't have to remove them one by one. It can be washed out and uh, with, you're going to commit for a stent so the dust can easily pass out itself. The problem with dusting is it takes time and whenever the stone is very hard, 
sometimes testing may not be quite a time saving procedure so in that case you need to plan for fragmenting and go ahead what is the difference in settings between testing and fragmenting uh, for testing it is low power high frequency for fragmentation it is uh, uh, high power and low frequency okay and, and what kind pulse, of sorry uh, i am aware that mm -hmm. in newer instruments the pulse width that else that can also be uh, changed okay so what is the importance of pulse width uh the pulse width uh, uh, it's mainly regarding uh, the uh, uh, the type of the uh, oh sorry i'm not sure about it i have sorry i have read it only as a new technology coming okay uh, we'll discuss okay. that uh, what kind of laser source you are using a uh, home em laser a okay. home em yag laser okay what is the watt of the machine how will you call the machine as high power uh, laser low power laser so we use the 50 watt laser which is a low power laser if it is a 100 plus watt then we call it as a high power laser uh, for a stone setting we need we uh, if, if it would be suitable if it can go up to at least 20 watts okay and you are using the same uh, laser for your holmium enucleation also i think isn't it yes yeah. yeah, same laser for we use the okay. low power laser yeah any new technology available with uh, holmium lasers uh, there is a um, uh, new moses effect available so mm -hmm. in the moses uh, it is a like a, a double bubble so uh, it compared to the standard uh, laser technology in the moses in the moses effect there is a initial bubble produced and through that bubble a second shock wave is gone so it, uh, uh, the advantage of that that is um, it, it is more precise that shock wave and it can produce more uh, effects on the stone compared to a single sh uh, uh, shock wave uh, sorry a single uh, uh, yeah laser shock wave uh, so i know that if if it is a moses moses effect is there there is a good vision uh, the hemostasis is much better and also the retropulsion is less So these are the things I know about Moses effect. Okay, uh, the you can word it slightly different also. The Moses mm -hmm. effect gives a kind of a, um, first wave and second wave, as you said. Wave. The wave from the tip of the laser is used to break the stone, and also since sometimes we are slightly away from the stone, it helps. it is getting dissipated in the surrounding media which is like uh, urine or the irrigating fluid by using the double wave the first wave is helping to clear the space so that the second wave can travel directly to the stone and give full energy to the stone rather than getting dissipated in the surrounding water medium or the urine so that's how we are able to give more energy to the stone there are some reports which says that retropulsion is avoided stone doesn't migrate and you've got a uh, faster fragmentation the disadvantages are the moses fibers are very costly and moses fibers if i'm correct were only single use and that really increases the cost while in non moses fibers you can use it as a reusable fiber depending upon the company with which you have procured the laser fibers so this moses fiber also has some effect in the holmi manipulation which we discussed in a previous episode when we discussed the hold up as a surgical option for the trp okay you are using the laser fiber and um, let us assume you are using the fragmentation setting what is your aim what is the size of fragments you are aiming for and how are you going to clear the stones uh i will aim to make the fragments uh uh About two uh, millimeter in size, uh, but even four millimeter is acceptable in a ureter. Um, and uh, I will not uh, uh, try to dust the stone completely. If it is like a stone fragments, uh, which uh, is at, at least half the size of the ureteric diameter visually, then that should be fine for a ureteric uh, laser lithotripsy. and also i'll make sure that there is no ureteric wall damage after the procedure uh, and we'll record if there is anything like that 
how you can measure your stone fragments that they are all adequate what are all the clues you have when you are doing laser lithotripsy with the ureteroscopy uh, so uh, uh, the normal diameter of the ureter except uh, is around 7 mm so if it is at least the half of the lumen of the uh, ureter we can assume that it will be around 3 to 4 mm um and the guide wire size is 0.038 of an inch so one third of an uh, so uh, uh yeah i usually use th- these two measurements to see if it is really small so if it is like a two or three times the size of gu- guide wire then also it is really small which can pass out okay sometimes during the procedure the ureter size is depending upon the individual patient some patients will have nicely dilated ureter some patients will have narrow ureter and guide wire will be sometime out of your focus and uh, may not be available in field to determine the size of the fragments mm-hmm. the easiest method is by using your laser fiber itself you said you are using a 200 micron laser okay. fiber mm-hmm. what is 200 microns in millimeter uh so it will be um, uh, uh divided by 1000 so point uh, uh 0.2 mm yeah so 1 mm is 1000 microns so 200 micron fiber is equal to 0.2 mm so you have something very clearly in your visual field which is 0.2 mm so wow. as long as compared to the laser fiber if you have a fragment which is like five times or six times your fragments will be like 1 mm or 1.5 mm maximum okay you have nicely fragmented it how are you going to retrieve the fragments um i can uh, you say stone stone basket for retrieval of the fragments and uh, um uh, also uh, uh, if if the scope can be passed beyond the stone and so the retrograde flow will also help to wash up the stone fragments by the side of the ureteroscope good once your stones are nicely fragmented you can use the basket to take a few pieces you can also use um, a zero tip basket or tip basket based upon your situation and uh, you can travel above the stone and use some irrigation to create a good proximal pressure so that uh, that will help to drive the stone down and uh, you can also use irrigation and then gradually descend down that will create a vortex effect and help the stones to follow you and you can take it up to the bladder and from bladder you can take it by using your cystoscope sheet during the completion anyway you need only few fragments for the clearance and uh, also for the metabolic analysis let's let us assume for this patient uh, you are quite careful and you are using a 200 micron fiber as soon as you started breaking the stone the stone migrated to the kidney you are able to go up to the kidney with a semi rigid ureteroscope but the stone has gone to lower pole calyx what is your next step um so i have to uh Uh, ins- insert a, a guide wire through the ureteroscope take the semi rigid ureteroscope out and request to, uh, for the availability of the uh, flexible ureteroscope uh, and uh, i will uh, uh, thread the uh, flexible ureteroscope through the second guide wire and under fluoroscopic guidance i'll make sure that it has reached to the level of the um, uh, Uh, the pelvic calcium system sorry before removing the ureteroscope i'll uh, gently do a uh, retrograde study to delineate the pelvic calcium system so once it is in the pelvic calcium system i'll attach the uh, tels- uh, uh, camera head and the irrigation and then i can you uh, can maneuver the scope into the lower pole and using a open tip basket i'll take the stone from the lower pole and keep it in the upper pole Uh, and i can continue lasering the uh, uh, stone uh, with the flexible ureteroscope what about uh, using an access sheet uh, you don't prefer it or uh, what is the advantage and disadvantage of it yeah so uh, uh, if it is a prolonged procedure uh, and if, the, if if we think that the stone burden is more it is better to use an access sheet the access sheet uh, helps in decreasing the operative time it, it helps in keeping the irrigation in a, a good irrigation good view and also it will decrease the intrarenal pressure and also if it also helps in uh, multiple uh, passages of the uh, ureteroscope uh, okay. so 
Okay, good. What is the principle of uh, Axis sheet sizes? So what size you will use if you want to use for this patient? Uh, ideally, we should use the smallest diameter available and adequate for the ureteric length. For a, a male, uh, so for the size, uh, we usually use the uh, 10, 11, which is that uh, 10 inner diameter and the 11 outer diameter. And the length for male patients, we use the 45 centimeter one. And uh, for female patients, we can use the uh, uh, shorter length, which is 35 centimeter one. But always, this has to be uh, done under fluoroscopy guidance only and over the guide wear only. Uh, uh, ureteric access sheets are uh, very notorious to cause ureteric injury. So if there is any difficulty doing the procedure on inserting the uh, access sheet, we have to be careful. If it is not going in, and then we can use the inner uh, 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 a part of the access sheet for the dilatation of the ureter and then again try with the inner and outer sheets in. So I'll make sure that I'm not pushing uh, too, I'm, I'm not putting too much of stress on the ureter by inserting the access sheet. Make sure that it is uh, washed with water because these are hydrophilic. So it will also allow in the uh, smooth passage of the access sheet. Yeah. Any equipment with um, inner, part, you can use the word stylet. So you can use stylet. the stylet to dilate. The stylet can be used in various equipments. And um, once you use the water uh, on the stylet and on the access sheet inside and outside, you can use the words like activating the hydrophilic nature of the access sheet. That will look more professional. And uh, by activating the hydrophilic nature, you are making it more ureter friendly. It won't cause a kind of a uh, um, ragged movement, it will smoothen your placement procedure, etc. If you have previously done a ureteroscope, you will know to a certain extent what may be the ureter's caliber. You can use that as a way to select what French access sheet you are going to use. And uh, if your ureteroscope has gone all the way up to the renal collecting system, you can easily use sometimes 12, 14 access sheet, which will again give you uh, better space for passing the flexible ureteroscopy and also better irrigation return. What is the principle of working of the flexible ureteroscopes? Flexible ureteroscope, uh, there are two types. One is the fiber optic flexible ureteroscope and the newer digital ureteroscopes. In the fiber optic, uh, the uh, uh, channel of the ureteroscope. Uh, it is uh, a plastic or coated sheet, and it contains um, uh, two types of fiber optic bundles. One is the coherent fiber optic uh, uh, fiber optic bundles to transfer the uh, transmit the image, and the non coherent fiber optic bundles to transmit the light. And there is uh, uh, two types of lenses. One is the uh, uh, ob objective lens at the level of the eyepiece and there is a other lens at the end of the ureteroscope. Uh, and also there is the irrigation channel. In the digital ureteroscope, uh, uh, it is replaced by a sensor at the tip. So it is called as a chip on tip technology. So instead of the uh, uh, optical fibers, the, the electric, electric fibers goes and transmit the electrical impulses from the sensor, and then it will be changed into image by the processor. Uh, and I'm aware that there are two types of uh, technology av available for the video ureteroscopes, which is the uh, uh, CCD technology, uh, charge coupled device and the CMOS technology. And I, I know that the CMOS technology is uh, much better. So it gives a better resolution, better field of view and better angle of view as well. So these are the two types of ureteroscopes. Good. So what is the primary principle, how that um, image is transmitted or light is transmitted inside the fiber optic cables? So the fiber optic cables, uh, these are uh, multiple fiber optic cables. So each fiber, uh, uh, cable uh, represents a part of the image. So we, uh, it's like a pixelation, like in a newspaper print. So each of the uh, uh, optic fiber will transmit a part of the image. And at the end, uh, it is uh, 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 all these small, small pixelated images are collated together. And then that's how we can 
uh, get the image in the screen. Uh, so simply put, it's like the newspaper print printing of the images. All these small dots coalesce together to reconstruct the image. Okay, that's why sometimes you will get a kind of a honeycomb effect if it is not appropriately focused. Mm -hmm. What do you see in this picture? So this is the uh, showing the total internal reflection uh, inside a tube. So this is the principle by which optical fibers work. So when the light passes, uh, it will get reflected inside and it move forwards. Okay. You mentioned the word coherent and you said for light, there is no need for coherence and for image transfer, you need coherence. What do you mean by that? So uh, it, uh, it, it is uh, difficult to make the coherent fibers. So coherent fibers uh, should be from the tip to the uh, uh, end of the imaging processor. It should be in a straight line. It should be, uh, uh, so the upper part of the image, uh, that fiber should come all the way down in the upper, upper part of the processor. If it goes in a different direction, then that the image will be distorted. So that, that, that's what it means coherent. So all the way, uh, it should maintain the orientation of the image. Okay, so in coherence means uh, it is important only for the image transfer. And uh, for example, the nine o'clock fiber should start at nine o'clock means it should end at nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. There is not necessity for the fiber to travel at nine o'clock position all throughout. During oh, the okay. course of the fibers, it can mingle a bit or it can be flexible or it can get angulated, doesn't matter. But in the image capturing end and in the eyepiece end, the nine o'clock fiber should be at nine o'clock so that your orientation is maintained. So if the stone is at uh, your three o'clock, you can move towards three o'clock and you will be virtually in correct place. So that's why the coherent is important for the image transfer. But as you said, for the light transfer, it doesn't matter. The light is light anywhere. So we don't have to need a coherent transmission. What are you seeing in this picture now? Uh, so you can see a flexible uh, ultroscope and uh, uh, this is the uh, leak tester. So once we um, attach this one, we increase the pressure in that one and there should not be any leak in the system. So this will make sure that there is no leak in the irrigation channel. Okay, why we have to do this? What do you mean by leak? Uh, so uh, during the procedure, um, uh, uh, for the passage of instruments, if there is any damage inside the uh, irrigation channel, uh, that can damage the um, laser fiber. And also if you're using a basket, it will not be easy to put the basket through. So it can make the uh, procedure difficult. So also intraoperatively, if we cannot insert an instrument, that will be also really difficult. So before starting the procedure, we had to make sure that there is no uh, damage inside the uh, irrigation channel. Or, uh, yeah, so that's why we use the leak test. Okay, so in the cross section of the flexible electroscope, there is an irrigation channel, which is the main port, also known as working channel, through which you pass your equipments, also accessories. And the fiber optic bundles are kept in that uh, separate channel. The fiber optic bundles are secured from the irrigation channel because we don't want water to egress into the fiber optic channel, which will damage the fibers and also will cause um, lack of clarity and loss of the vision and image transfer. So okay. that fiber optic cable is almost like a vacuumized, uh, completely sealed one. Before starting the procedure, we need to make sure that that compartment is leak free. That's why we are using this leak test. So during the leak test, as you use the bellow to increase the pressure. The pressure should stay there and it should not leak anywhere. Mm -hmm. There is a parallel working channel running along this. So when you are using the laser fiber, if you are using an accessory which is sharp enough to create a scratch or you inadvertently remove the laser fiber into the working channel and uh, activated the laser, it can cause a kind of incision in the working channel, which will result in damage to the secure nature of the fiber optic cable network. In that case, the air which you are injecting will get leaked into the working channel 
and that's a sign that the leak test is failed. If you do this test before the procedure, then you should not use this equipment further for that particular surgery because by using it, you are allowing the patient's body fluids to enter the working channel, which can make the working channel more infected and also it can damage the working channel more. If the leak is identified early at the early stage, repair cost will be less. And also at least people won't blame that you have broken the flexible uretroscope. Similarly, after the procedure, you need to do the leak test after the uretroscope to make sure that the integrity of the fiber optic bundle is maintained. Okay, that's an important topic. Mm -hmm. In this comparative chart, we are discussing the difference between the fiber optic bundle and the CCD CMOS chip digital bundle, which you have discussed. We just go through this quickly because it will be a good knowledge source. So the initial reception in the field of vision, as you said, is chip on the tip technology by using CCD or CMOS chip positioned on the distal tip of the ultroscope by using light emitting diode, which is a source for the light. Mm -hmm. While in fiber optic bundle, the objective lens at the distal end of the ultroscope with a light diode receives the reflected right rays and it takes all the way into the fiber optic bundle. Reception of the initial image is the photons are converted to a series of electrons. So there is a better method of conversion and transmission of the image. While in case of fiber optic bundle, the refracted light rays are focused and it's taken as the light rays. Transmission is by using the wires within the ultroscope Mm -hmm. which transmit the electrons. And we know that electrons can transfer better with wires. While in case of fiber optic bundle, we are using the fiber optic bundle itself to transmit the light. That's why the quality of the light and quality of the image may not be as good as we use the flexible ultroscope for multiple procedures. Right. The final image display, the image processor received is only an electric signal and it is converted into a real time display. So that's why the electric signal, the signal loss is very less. So the real time display will be much better. While in fiber optic bundle, we need a camera which is located in the, your eyepiece end and that receives the light rays and that takes the message into your displaying on screen. Now, this is an, another way of looking at the difference between the fiber optic ultroscope and digital ureteroscope. We have discussed the technology, now we are discussing the ureteroscope as such. Okay. If you see the digital ureteroscope is everything is like a single inbuilt. There is no separate cord for the light source. There is no separate like to the camera cord. Everything is integrally built. You're not attaching the camera head directly into the ureteroscope. The best example is if you are doing flexible cystoscopes in most of the hospitals in UK, the flexible cystoscopes are at least digital cystoscopes. While in ureteroscopes, not many hospitals have invested in digital ureteroscope because of the cost. Fiber optic ureteroscopes needs an external camera. Mm -hmm. Since there is an external camera, the weight of the fiber optic ureteroscope is almost like 576 gram, which is much more weighing. So the head is more weighing. So that will come into play when you're doing ultroscope for one hour, two hour long procedures. It results in ergonomics of the surgeon and fatigue, etc. The image resolution is brilliant, as you said, for CMOS or CCD chip, which can go up to 60,000 pixels. And the number of lines per 10 millimeter is 3.17, while for fiber optic ultroscope, it's only 1.41. As we discussed, image quality is superior with better color representation, while in fiber optic, if it is not properly focused, you can see the honeycomb lattice is superimposed, but you can focus it out. Okay. The problem with the digital electroscope or disadvantage is because of the chip on the tip, the tip diameter, the technologically, they are not able to bring it down. So as of now, the size available is 8.4 to 9.9 .9 French. While as we discussed in fiber optic, we can go even up to 4.5 French, at least in the tip. Okay. Since it's a newer technology, digital ultroscopes are very costly, while fiber optic, because of the mature technology, it is a bit minimalized in the cost because the investment in the research is now nicely balanced. 
the durability of digital iroscopes is brilliant because mm -hmm. the there is no fibers involved the conduction is only through the simple wires which were traveling the electrons so it can be used for even 60 or 150 uses while for fiber optic because of the fragility especially it's not only fragile during your procedure it will be fragile during the transport during the sterilization techniques etc mm -hmm. it can stand on an average of 27 or 30 uses there is a bows audit on it but i know personally there are some surgeons even in uk personally taken care of the fiber optic microscope and used it for 100 or 150 procedures so it can be used if it is properly handled okay um any questions in the iridoscope technology uh no i mean uh, the last table of comparison was amazing uh, mm -hmm. yeah thank you great good so this can be used as like a like a baseline diagram to take it forward i thought of discussing the pcnl in the same sitting today but because of lack of time we will do some more in depth questions in iridoscopes and we will finish it today but you yeah. can discuss pcnl maybe in the next episode now you are using the technology of using a basket to transport the lower calcium stone to the upper calyx why is that why can't you use the laser to break the stone in the lower pore itself what is the advantage in that um so the laser fiber uh, it is due to the loss of efficiency of the uh, uh, laser so when the laser fiber is bent uh, it is uh, it cannot uh, transmit the uh, laser energy more efficiently um and also uh, because the laser fiber is coated with glass there is a chance that it can break inside the fiber which and can cause leak inside the fiber which can damage the scope so to be on the safe side and also for uh, efficient fragmentation of the stone the, the uh, ideal ergonomics for the laser fiber is to keep it in a straight line as much as possible that's why we are transferring it into an upper pole so that the laser fiber be laser fiber will be straight yes so at least for people in the early learning curve it's very safe to transfer the stone by using a basket to the upper pole so that you are using the laser fiber in the straight line the other main disadvantage is when you located the stone in the lower pole if you need to do in situ fragmentation then you can't pass the laser fiber in a bent scope you need to straighten the scope and then pass the laser fiber adequately and then you need to bend back to the lower pole and find the stone with the laser fiber in situ your irrigation will come down with the bend also the irrigation will come down further which will make the identification of stone quite challenging and as you said sometimes if the laser fiber breaks down during the procedure it can cause damage to the inner sheath of the working channel as we discussed that can cause breakage of the channel walls and um, water egressing into the fiber optic channel which can result in damage to the fiber optic bundle that results in a quite a big cost and investment mm -hmm. what kind of basket you will use to transfer the stone from lower pole to upper pole um so my choice of preference will be uh, i know only the trade name sorry so it is like the open open tip which is called the engage uh, Uh, so it is easier to uh, uh, open in a, a lava pole to catch a hold of the stone and to keep it always under vision during the procedure we can also use the tipless basket which is called the end circle uh, but uh, during the opening of the end circle there is a chance that the the scope will be pushed back a little bit when it opens in inside the calyx uh, so i would prefer the uh, tipless open design of engage if possible but if not we can also use the tipless round uh, of the uh, end circle basket i'm also aware that there are other types of uh, basket designs available like the segura type of basket and also uh, the tetrahedral geometric configuration basket available so these are things i know yeah. about basket yeah there are various baskets available the main um, thing to know especially for the calicial stone even if it is in the other calyx is not only the lower calyx is it's better to use the tipless types like a zero tip basket or the open tip type like the engage as you said the reason is if you have the tipless 
the tipless basket can go up to the calicial wall and then when you open it the chances of holding the stone is very high while in the tip basket the tip itself can occupy easily few millimeters so the tip won't allow you to go to the base of the calyx and uh, keep the basket flushed with the calicial base so that the stone can be captured that's the main reason and then when you are repositioning the best position to reposition is the upper calyx and uh, once you leave the stone you can keep your flexible uterscope in straight line and use the laser in straight line which will give a better irrigation flow also some people can bring the stone to the upper ureter the problem is again the stone will migrate since you have used your scopes few times the upper ureter will be nicely dilated so upper calyx is a better place to park and uh, fragment or dust the stones again the principles are almost the same you need to dust or fragment based upon the hardness of the stone there is nothing wrong in starting with the dusting settings and then based upon your timings and how you progress you can change the settings gradually pulse width also is a very good tool and uh, it is very important to tailor the settings to the particular stone rather than having a quite rigid protocol that will help you to learn various tips and tricks and combinations and once you fragmentate you can use the basket to retrieve the fragments for stone analysis if it is dusting you can just flush it out and it will pass it on by itself what is your exit strategy when you use access sheath and flexible ultrascopy and stone is now nicely fragmented um so uh, when uh, i i'll make sure that uh, the uh, safety wire is in place with the uh, fluoroscopy and uh, do, when i uh, retract the flexible ureteroscope i uh, i'll inspect the ureter i'll make sure that the whole lumen is uh, visualized and once i reach the area of the access sheet i'll keep the tip of the flexible ureteroscope at the tip of the access sheet and then we draw the access sheet along with the ureteroscope at the same time uh, visualizing the whole ureteric wall making sure that there is no damage to the ureteric ureteric wall and once uh, the whole assembly is in the bladder uh, we can take it out uh, together and then i'll again make sure that the uh, wire is not displaced during this procedure so if there is any doubt i'll keep on hold of the, on the wire as well i mean the safety guide wire as well will you stent the patient yeah definitely sorry so after the procedure uh, uh th th through the uh, guide wire i used as a safety guide wire i will um, uh, uh, use the cystoscope and backload the uh, safety guide wire with the help of a ureteric uh, catheter or or even with the pusher of the uh, stent uh, and then after backloading i'll insert the cystoscope keep the cystoscope beak at the level of the ureter orifice and then uh, make sure that uh, the wire is still in position and then insert the uh, stent under uh, fluoroscopic guidance and confirm the position of the uh, safe deployment of the j uh, at the level of the pelvis and also at the level of the ureter and uh, uh, after uh, removing the pusher from the cystoscope if there is any stone fragments that is seen in the bladder i can retrieve it for analysis and also i i make sure sure that the bladder is empty after the procedure uh, and yeah so uh, very and there is no need good so whenever you use an access sheath always it's very safe to place a stent because access sheath is dilating a ureter which is like 6 french or 8 french to the level of 14 french especially at the level of buj initially when you are doing the procedure you may see the ureter is quite uh, nice no edema and uh, no signs of any minor injuries but if you are not keeping the stent then the patient's inflammatory and reactive metabolism will work on and causes the edema on a later state especially in the buj and the tight parts of the ureter like crossing vessels and puj so whenever you are doing ureteroscopy for the first time and whenever you use an access sheath it's always safe to put a stent if you are very confident you can keep a ureteric catheter overnight and remove it next day morning you can keep a stent with uh, strings on place so that you can remove the stent even after 24 to 48 hours mm -hmm. less 
duration of stent placement better for the patient and no stent is always best for the patient. Whenever you are using very miniaturized ureteroscope like 4.5 French slash 6 French ureteroscope or if the patient was previously stented, patient had previous history of ureteroscopies, the ureter will be more pliable and you can plan a stentless ureteroscopy procedure. As you said, finally, when you're emptying the bladder, make sure that the fragments are collected for the stone analysis. Do you have any questions in these scenarios before we complete? Uh, no, I mean, this was a really good session. I learned a lot today and uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for all those uh, explanations and detailed uh, things about the ureteroscopes. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. I thought of completing the PCNL in one go, but uh, since we went a little bit detailed in ureteroscope, which is quite good and useful for others, we will keep the PCNL for our next episode. Mm -hmm. All the pictures and tables used in this episode is from two books. One is a book which is on ureteroscopy by Bradley Schwartz and uh, John Distant. It's available and it's a very good book and with a lot of much detailed uh, notes. The other book which I usually use is from India by Ravindra Sabmis and Arvind Ganpule Group, Urology Instrumentation, a Comprehensive Guide. I'm very thankful for these authors and I'm crediting the image and the table usage from them. I will try to add the links for these books in the description for those who are interested to read the full book. And they are all very, very good source, not only for ultroscopy, for even the other instruments. And uh, this urology instrumentation, a comprehensive guide, is covering like PCNL, monopolar, bipolar, TURP, robots, and various other interesting things. And these books are a must for uh, exam going trainees of a material. Right. Very good. Thank you for your time and wishing you a nice week ahead.